Megan thinks that I tend to go for the joke rather than the truth when I'm in a conversation, and that's because I'm afraid of her. Not true. My name is Craig Ferguson. I am a stand-up comedian, an actor, a writer, and a talk show host. Darling. I'm also the husband of a very beautiful and clever woman called Megan Ferguson. Max? She is my best friend and the love of my life. Yeah. But that doesn't mean we agree on everything. I sometimes wonder if we agree on anything. It's not like you say, oh, that guy's a psychopathy. Psychopathy? You can't say, oh, well, he's you, you, it's well, you don't say he's a psychopath. 13 years ago, we started a conversation, and it has never stopped. Still going. Yeah, I just think you're, I think you're wrong. No. Yes. Sometimes it stops for a bit, you know, for sleeping. <laughs> In this program, we try really hard to get new perspectives on our discussions. Food is the new internet. You, you'll make it plenty of money. The universe is alive within us. Whoa, this is magical. We reach our conclusions by getting the facts straight from the horse's mouth. And by horse's mouth, I mean experts, uh, not an actual horse. Hi. Obviously. for this lady. She's not taping us. <laughs> it was the statue. I like, I like <laughs> when, when people like see a camera and then crouch and run because they think it makes them invisible. Like, you're not Harry Potter, you know. We were on vacation. Nothing better than hanging around fjords and mm -hmm. stuff. I can't remember what we say to the street to drive on. No. I just like drive weave? I'll middle. just weave. Do you know what it should always be? Yes? Turn right okay. Gate. No, I'm not turning right on Plump's Gate. I th is it turn is right? right? Yes. Gate. Shut yes, up! Right. This turn woman turn is very chatty, and I is. don't like her. She's bossy and English. Do you think... Oh, <laughs> the English GPS. Hi, you've done rather well for a Scottish yeah. person, haven't you? What's a Scottish person uh, doing yes. in an expensive in rental car? car? Yes, exactly. On holidays, are you? But it, it's a fact of life, though. You take the wrong turn, and your life can change immediately. You know who's a perfect example? Who's a perfect example? Yo Nesbo. I wanted to meet Yo Nesbo again, because I had him on the late night show, and I liked him. He is someone who's had a lot of different turns in his life. It's really out here, isn't it? So I want to talk to him about that. There ain't no stopping, no, no more trying. All this. Are you sure this is it? Oh, uh, it looks cozy to me, but I, I think it's it. Okay. It's adorable. That's kind of nice. All right. Well. Do you think there'll be a troll? <laughs> Before you can meet John Nesbo, answer you must questions. answer the questions three. Oh. Oh my God! You live here, man. Does everyone in Norway have one of these? We all have one of these. We get this when we get born. You know, one each. Come here, we want to talk to you about yeah, something. We have, we have questions. questions. Come down. Okay. Joe Nesbo. Joe Nesbo is a best selling author known for the Harry Hole detective crime novels. Nesbo has sold 36 million copies of his novels worldwide. But life wasn't always like this. He was once a successful soccer player in Norway's Premier League. Then he prospered as a financial analyst by day. And by night, he was a chart-topping rock star. So my guess is that Nesbo can tell us a thing or two about having the guts to leave the perceived paved road of your life and career. Is it all about the pursuit of happiness? So here's what I want to ask. Anyone who knows you, particularly in America, thinks of you as a writer of crime stories. But that is clearly not what you set out to be. Was it something that you wanted to be? Is it free will? Mm. Or did you make a decision, I'm not happy here, I want to follow my dream and, and be a crime writer? What, what was it for you? It's, um, I think it's hard to analyze your own decisions. But I think when I look at my own life and lives of my friends, I, I think there's a, there's a mix. But I do think, looking back, that I was on my way to writing something 
uh, not necessarily a crime novel. I think uh, I ended up with a crime novel that was um, partly coincidental. But the fact that I'm writing would have happened no matter what. So you feel like that was something that you couldn't not do? That it was uh, just in you and had to come out? Yeah, it was. I, I grew up in a home where there were books everywhere. My, my mother was a librarian. I would read from when I was very young. And I would write poems. Actually, maybe it's not a coincidence that I, I ended up writing crime novels because when I went to school, we had to write essays with lame titles as A Nice Day in the Woods, right? <laughs> and I would write that essay, only in uh, my essay, nobody would come back alive. <laughs> um, so maybe I was headed for the crime novel anyway. It's a funny thing, though, that if you write about crime, do you find yourself getting depressed when you write? Does it cheer you up to get it out of you? What does it do? Uh, well, it's, um, I think it's a little bit both. It's, um, uh, I mean, when you stay in that universe of my protagonist, Harry Hope, it is, I wouldn't say depressing, but it's tiring. Uh, right. But then again, I wouldn't compare it to working in dark places. I mean, if you work down in the dark cellar of psychiatry or if you work mm -hmm. in a prison or even in the police, I mean, you can't really leave. Those are real people you are working with. Um, I can leave at any time. I can, I can shut the door to that universe and have a normal life. And I don't wake up at night having nightmares about my protagonist or my characters. Right. You um, dip in and so, out. So, so I wouldn't exaggerate the toll it takes on you to, to, to write about dark stuff. Then again, I do get tired. And it is sort of bizarre to wake up in the morning and have a, uh, an idea for something really gruesome. And you mm. go like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, you think about it, though. Right. If you take the wrong turn at any point in your life, it's like that Sliding Doors movie. If I had not gone to see that movie, I would have been much happier, because <laughs> that's a crap movie. But it makes an interesting point. You make one little change, and your life could be completely different. That's absolutely true. What would have happened if you had not done your first stand-up routine? You were just in Cumbernauld. What Ten. about alternative universes, though? An alternate reality where you and I never meet and that would be so awful. Like, you and I met because I went to a party. My great-grandmother always said, go to the party because you never know who you may meet. Right. I met you. If I hadn't gone to the party, I wouldn't have the boys, I wouldn't have you. It would be very sad. Yeah. When we met, that was kind of decisive because we met at this party and Megan was there oh, yeah. with her <laughs> French boyfriend. Yeah. He was very swanky. Mm -hmm. And we were talking for a bit, and, and I said, come on, let's get out of here, Blondie, and, you know, hit the town, or something like that. And she said, I'm here with my boyfriend. I was like, what? Where is he? She said, he's on the other side of the room over there. I said, well, if you were my girlfriend, you would not be on the other side of the room talking to a man like me. I was like, oh, got me. You're welcome, kids. <laughs> Try it yourself. Gosh, that was a bit intense. Jeez. <laughs> Norwegian bus driver, fuck you. I never wanted to be this. I wanted to write crime novels. I wonder, because I experienced when I was a kid, I come from a kind of respectable background. I think you do too, mm. that, you know, your mother is a librarian. Your father, I think, was a, a banker of some kind, yeah. is that right? So even if you believe that um, I want to work in the arts, you kind of suppress any dream you have of that kind of life. Mm. And it's interesting to look at you as, because you were in a successful band mm. and still working in a bank. Yeah. That's kind of a, holding on to the safety yeah. net for a long time. My reasons for keeping my day job while the rest of the band, they, uh, they would be, you know, full-time musicians. It's kind of a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde right. existence. And I think I needed, after having been this rock and roll animal in the weekends, to go back to something that is really Suit and boring and, and where nobody knows who you are, sort of, on Monday morning. Mm -hmm. You're just one of the, mm -hmm. the stockbrokers at the bank and, and, and you're nothing special. I think that that was healthy for me. So my my parents used years? to say to me, yeah. they used so, to say, get a job. Before yeah. you do anything artistic, get a trade behind you. Do your stand-up at night, but uh, yeah, get, right, get up yeah. in the morning. You know? And, the, and, the and weird... it was the same thing with the band. Yeah, you know, and, playing the band. And, and that was the weird but... thing, because all of the guys I know who did that are now all out of work. 
the shipyards closed down, the factories closed down, the whole, everything closed down. All the stuff that was meant to make you secure is gone. Yeah. You know, and I'm the only one with a job. <laughs> but, but then again, you are waiting to live the dream. So you say, okay, let's work for another two years, yes. three years, and then you can quit your job and do whatever you want to do, whether that is being, doing stand-up, playing in the band, or writing a novel. Well, what was the catalyst that pushed you to leave that safety net? Actually, and... I think uh, looking back, I had to take a break both from right. the band and the brokerage firm. So I went to Australia where I wrote my first novel. Uh, the reason why I did that was my father died four years earlier. Mm. And my father, he had had a very dramatic life. And his plan was when he got retired was to write the book about his years during World War II. Mm. And he died the same, same year as he retired. So he never had the time to do that. And what happened to me was when my father died and I realized that there are no guarantees Absolutely. that you are going no. to live forever. Yeah. There are Absolutely. no guarantees that you'll be here for the next three years. I can remember the computer in those days, they would take like 30 seconds to light up the screen, yeah. right? So I would push the on button and waiting for the usual numbers, you know, the Dow Jones, the Nikkei index, the oil price, mm -hmm. dollar rates, stuff like that. And during those 30 seconds, I realized I don't have time for this. Right. I have to do I something to else. I had to write. So I went to the boss at the brokerage firm and said, thank you for these years, but I don't have time for this. And he totally understood. You know, I, I've got a bit of a problem with your Nesbo because like, I, I think I'm a little bit in love with him. You know, he's like really cool and he does what he wants. I do that for the most part creatively, but I still suffer a little bit from how much for that job. You know, which is something I grew up with. You know, sometimes like when I hosted a game show and like some comics would be like to me, oh, you did that job for the money. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did it for the money. It's because because that's what, you know, when you come from a working class background and somebody says, uh, you know, will you do this job? Your first question is, how much do I get paid for it? With Joe, I don't think he does that anymore, but I think he understands what it is and has done it. And to me, that makes him a more relatable artist. Did it ever occur to you, and maybe this is a little out of line, but did it ever occur to you to write the book your father wanted to write? Well, I, I sort of did. Uh, oh, yeah? um, my, my father grew up in Brooklyn uh, with my uh, grandmother. They came back to Norway just before World War II. And uh, Germany then occupied Norway in, um, in uh, 1940. And uh, uh, my grandparents and my father, he had grew up in this very anti-communist place and uh, surrounding. Um, so they were actually more afraid of Stalin and Russia as a border to Norway than to the Germans. So my father, since Norway was occupied, he made the decision at the age of 19 to volunteer to fight with the Germans against uh, Stalin's troop outside oh, Leningrad. And that was, so he spent the war in the trenches outside Leningrad. Jeez. And uh, uh, he was injured uh, at the end of the war and went to Austria and then came back at the end of the war and had to spend three years in jail for, uh, for treason. Wow. Um, that was the stories he was going to tell, you know, making a decision at the age of 19. How does the world look to a young man in 1940 with all the democracies, the old democracies being more or less bankrupt, like England and, and France, and Europe's future looking like something that will be decided among the two strong men, Stalin and Hitler. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then making that decision, and making the wrong decision, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, which he, um, uh, he always said after the war, he told me that, you know, spending three years in jail for making, a, being as wrong as I was, was actually a fair price to pay, I think. Really? And actually, my third novel, called The Red Breast, is about five young Norwegians fighting with the Germans and having different motives for doing so. Uh, and that was my, my father's story. That's so I remember it in the book, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, I, I never realized that's what it was. Wow. And all the most bizarre details in that book about what happens in the trenches outside Leningrad, that's my wow. father's wow, story. that's his story. Yeah. I think so many people uh, kid themselves. 
it's nothing wrong about it, no malice in it, but thinking I'll, I'll get to that, whatever yeah. I dream of doing, and just don't. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I do, I understand that my father died very young. Mm. He was 44 and he died of cancer. Yeah. And I did grow up with this sense of that you don't, it, there is no guarantee that yeah. you won't get sick or that there won't be an accident somewhere. My father died very young. My family uh, has a family business in New England and it was expected of him that he would go to school, go to business school, go back and, and run the family company. And I know he never wanted to do that. So when he got sick and died, having not followed the path he wanted to do, I believe he died angry. So I think that if you can avoid that, not that everybody should just throw life to the wind and, and run out and, and live your dreams, because you do have other people to consider, but to die angry because you didn't make a decision, you didn't take the turn, it seems so sad. I think most of the choices I made, I, I think I would do them all over again, um, even knowing what what I would lose, because you do, of course, lose lose something. You can't um, you can't do everything you want to do in uh, life. I, I could have, uh, I guess, like most fathers would say, spend more time with my daughter. She's mm -hmm. 18 now, and I know that I can't go back and have that time with her when she was eight, 10, 12. Uh, I can't do that, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I wish I could. But then I would have there would be other stuff that I wouldn't do. If, if that would have meant that one of my novels, that I wouldn't have the time to write that novel, I, I still would have cho chosen the novel. I would have chosen the novel. I would. I think when I became a parent, all my decision-making process from that point was all based on the welfare of my children. Uh, it just changes you. And I don't say that to appear in any way particularly moral. It just, it just is. It just, that's the way... That's the way it is. I'm like, oh, I, I can't do that. I think as practical as I am, any time I've looked in my life before Craig and I got married, any of the decisions I made were really leaps of faith. If you think too much about something, you probably won't do it. So if you just go with what your gut is saying, well, for me, it's worked out for the best. I think it's an interesting thing you said, though, that you can't have everything that you want mm -hmm. in life. And I think maybe people think that success is having everything that you want. Mm -hmm. I sometimes think that about Vincent van Gogh, right? Vincent van Gogh, because he painted at least one of the great paintings, and probably mm -hmm. more he painted in a lunatic asylum. Today, he would have been given efficient medication to make him more comfortable. And he would have been, I, I have no doubt, happier. And I wonder what choice he would have made. Yeah. Right. Like, if it was me, I'd be like, I don't need to paint irises. <laughs> Do you ever think of living anywhere else? I did. I mean, I, I have a job which means I could, I can work anywhere from, you uh, anywhere. From, from anywhere. But I keep com uh, coming back here. It's, uh, I think, uh, you know, when you're young and your parents talk about roots and stuff like that, you go, oh, yeah, boy, you know, roots, I, I don't need roots. I need to see new places. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you've seen so many places that it's luxury to wake up in your own bed. It's, and the people you want to talk to are old friends where you don't need to say and explain right. everything. You can just say, you know who I am. Right. We, we can just, you know, uh, Norwegians aren't good with small talk to begin with. Yeah, I've noticed the Norwegians and small talk thing. They're, they're, they're right. bad at it. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> but I think that's kind of good. Scottish people are a bit like that too. And then oh, they get, yeah. then they get liquored so? up. I... Yeah, and then they get liquored up chat, a little bit. Chat, and... chat, chat. Well, yes. that's Scottish true. Scottish people yeah. are as chat. You know what, you're right, I'm yeah. completely wrong about that. <laughs> yeah. Scottish people do they talk a lot. They are social chat machines. Yeah. Um, I don't know. 
I think, though, that Charles Dickens should live in London in the 19th mm -hmm. century. I think that you should live in Oslo. I think that Stephen King should, Stephen live, King in should live in the part of Maine. Yeah, you know, it's like, it is all of that. But I don't know, I think for myself, I, I wonder, I wonder, I don't know, I don't have that. There's not an identifiable kind of area of the world. I don't feel that anymore. I think that, that that's actually what I'm thinking. I mean, we're, we're thinking it's maybe time to, to get out of LA. Yeah, yeah? I think so. And um, I'm thinking Norway. Yeah, well, today, <laughs> Scotland or Los Angeles? Ooh, tough choice. I think leaving LA, what would we lose? The sound of the leaf blowers in the morning. That beautiful chorus of pointless machines moving leaves from here to there. Let's do a little pros and cons list. Scotland, bad weather. Oh. Los Angeles, bad driving. driving. You know, there's more to life than, uh, than freeways. Scotland, good schools don't cost much. Los Angeles, not so great schools. Cost a lot. Cost a lot. Los Angeles can really start to grate on your nerves after a while. Really sunny all the time. I can't do any of this. No, flip this is coin. too much, yeah. All I right. think you should just flip All right, coin. head okay. Scotland, tails Los Angeles. Okay, right? okay. But let's make a wish instead. Take the coin and put it in the fountain. Okay. And it, whatever you wish for will come true. It wasn't ever really a plan for me to be in Los Angeles. And I definitely dream about leaving it. <laughs> what did you wish for? You'll see. So there's no such thing as predestination. There's only... <laughs> there's only Megan's choice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So is this the last stop for you? Do you think there'll be another big career change? Uh, I've had so many jobs in my life. I mean, I, I, I worked as a taxi driver. I worked in a, uh, on a boat, on a fishing boat in the, in the factory. Um, and a stockbroker, musician. R being a writer is the best job mm -hmm. I've had. Um, I, I can't think of any, any job that is better than that, so I think this might be what uh, I'll be doing for the rest of my life. I, I, I hope so. Satisfaction, that's wonderful. Mm. Oh, I mean, cab driving. Yeah, then it's again. It's Uber then now. Again, it's a whole different again. thing, yeah. you know? I mean, yeah. to I go back rule that. it out. The thing is, the thing is, Greg, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, um, I'm actually a bad driver. <laughs> I, I drove a taxi well, for five like years <laughs> every summer holiday when I was a student. I just... Uh, but, uh, there was not much sign of improvement. I, I, I just don't have the talent for All right, well, you, you stick with the writing. Stick to yeah, writing. And leave the I cab will. driving to the professional. I will. <laughs> right. Same, same, everything's the same, but nothing is right. How can everything change? It's a lot of food for thought, isn't it? He's a smart man, that yeah, Nesbo. He is. Yes, we've talked about choices and decisions and you know, forks in the roads, all, all that today. Yeah. But I feel like, particularly with Joe, that chose him. He kind of... Yeah, I think he was going was to... That was in him. He was always going to be a writer, whether yeah. or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then what he regretted was rather touching as well. Mm. He wished he'd spent more time with his daughter. Yeah. We should find the kids and spend some time with them. Oh, I think we can hold off a minute. <laughs>